Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining for the third day of this 20th IVS 20th vaccinology course. I am Ravi Ganapati, head of vaccine development department in IVA, belonging to the science unit. And I will be moderating today's session on uh, preclinical studies and vaccine development for COVID-19. We have five speakers today, including myself, and you can see those uh, uh, lectures uh, by a sketch on the screen. And uh, I'll be talking on overview of vaccine development and manufacturing. Following me, Professor Nikolai Petrovsky from uh, Chairman Vaccine Private Limited um, Australia, and then Professor Flinders University. He'll be speaking on COVID-19 vaccines and adjuvants. The third lecture will be by Dr. Hannah Schuttmacher. She'll, she is the head of uh, Global Head in Viral Vaccine Delivery from Janssen Pharmaceuticals, j and And she'll be speaking on vector-based COVID-19 vaccine. The fourth lecture will be by Dr. Mark Page, uh, Principal Scientist, NABSC, UK. And he'll be speaking on laboratory assessment of vaccines. And the last lecture of the day will be by Dr. Neil Berry. And he'll be speaking on um, the vaccine development in non-human primate model. And he's also a Principal Scientist in NABSC, UK. So I just have, before we start the lecture, a few house, housekeeping notes, as we have done uh, previously. So as today, the live session also will be starting the same time on all the rest of the two days for the course. And uh, there is a Q&A button at the end of the uh, um, picture in your Zoom. And please submit your questions through that um, link. And then all the presentation files will be shared after the course. Um, you can view that until the end of this week. After the end of each lecture, there will be a short evaluation poll, which will be popping up. Please uh, um, provide your responses, and press the submit button, and they're anonymous. And for those who are joining live on Zoom, an attendance rate of 90% will be checked uh, in their five-day session. Uh, it will be checked by uh, our people, and then people who qualify will be given an e-certificate at the end of the session. And uh, thank you, and uh, we'll start the lecture with the first one on uh, um, overview of vaccine development and manufacturing. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. This is Ravi Ganapati, uh, heading the viral vaccine process development in uh, IVI. I'm here for about two and a half years, and I have about 25 years in vaccine industry, almost 28 years of oral experience. I'm going to talk about the vaccine development and manufacturing uh, development pathways in general to give you an overall idea how a vaccine is developed from initial stages until the <clears throat> commercial launch. So this is going to be my topic, overview of vaccine development and manufacturing. This is going to be my outline. <clears throat> I'll be <clears throat> talking from the vaccine definition until up to uh, some of the development concepts. And I've also attached an appendix at the end, which will be shared as part of the file, uh, as a PDF file, so that you can refer it back after the talk. So many of you might know what is this, so I'm not explaining it. So vaccines generally introduce safe amounts of antigens into the body as uh, pre preparation of the body to produce <clears throat> and immune response when it is again exposed to the same organism in future. And vaccines are beneficial in several ways as shown in this slide uh, through health gains, healthcare cost savings, care-related productivity gains, outcome-related productivity gains, behavior-related productivity gains, and community externalities. Even people who are unvaccinated can benefit due to the herd immunity concept. So based on the different components of a vaccine development, uh, you can be divided, uh, um, divided into four different uh, sets of pathways. Uh, based on components, it's a discovery phase, process development phase, clinical development phase, and assay development phase. If you go by program-based uh, separation of the timeline, it is preclinical feasibility studies, followed by translational projects, followed by the final um, confirmation of POC, phase through licensure, and then commercialization. If you go by the stakeholder requirements, as you see in the bottom left table, uh, it, it can be a discovery phase where universities, institutions, and small and uh, bigger biotech industry are involved. Then the product development phase where there is need for expertise, experience, infrastructure, and resources. And the delivery phase, again, where the pharma industry comes in along with governments and international agencies. So going by the clinical development pathway, which will be dealt in a separate talk, 
uh, it can be from the discovery phase to phase one, phase two, phase three, and then licensure uh, submission, and then followed by that uh, post approval phase for uh, monitoring the safety. So the approval process goes through mainly three different uh, phases: pre IND, IND, and then application phase. Once the license is approved, finally post allowance to the market, uh, the vaccine ev adverse event reporting system kicks in, uh, where uh, based on the different uh, regulatory requirements of the particular country, uh, there will be a periodic reporting of the safety events of the par product post marketing has to be submitted. And based on all the information developed during your pre IND filing, during which you have a POC established proof of concept and the IND filing during which you have a process developed, a full technology uh, and uh, analytical assays developed, a tox studies done along with this clinical trial protocol submission, and then biologic licensing application at which phase you have completed all your clinical trials and then submitting the data to the regulatory authorities to get the necessary approval for licensure. So before going in, we'll just go through a uh, few general terms quickly, and all these are from the ICH Q8 R2 uh, quality by design, which is a systematic approach to development that begins with predefined objectives and emphasizes product and process understanding and process control based on sound science and quality risk management. Target product profile, which is a prospective summary of the quality characteristics of a drug product that relatively ideally will be achieved to ensure a desired quality, taking into account safety and efficacy of the drug product. And then the critical quality attribute, which is a physical, chemical, biological, or microbiological property or characteristic that should be within an appropriate limit range or distribution to ensure the desired product quality. And then finally, the critical process parameter, which is a range of the process parameters which should meet the CQA. And all these things will be dealt a little more detail in the subsequent slides. GMP is the <clears throat> manufacturing principle which is generally followed to produce the, all the uh, vaccines which is a set of principles and procedures which when followed by manufacturers of therapeutic goods helps ensure that the products manufactured will have the required quality in terms of safety, identity, strength, purity, and quality. Uh, current GMP, that is the C in CGMP, indicates that the GMP expectations are dynamic. They provide for systems that assure proper design, monitoring, and control of manufacturing processes and facilities. Why piece of GMP are generally people, premises, processes, products, and procedures. When all five are taken care, the sixth P, which is profit results. Validation is again an important term during the development and the commercialization process of a vaccine. So validation, it has actually two components. One is a new process validation, where you actually compare the consistency of the lot produced which are defined the process parameters to meet the defined quality control, uh, critical quality attributes. And then uh, when there is a process change during your uh, post approval, then this compares the consistency uh, to the lots produced earlier with the existing process with the modified process so that they all meet specifications and they are comparable. So FDA defines it as the collection and evaluation of data from the process design stage through commercial production, which establishes scientific evidence that a process is capable of consistently delivering a quality product, AMA almost gives the same definition for process validation. So coming to a non-clinical or preclinical studies, because these terms are interchangeably used, just wanted to give you a, a distinction if there is any. Preclinical refers to studies occurring prior to clinical testing and non-clinical studies which are not related to or involving or concerned with the direct observation and treatment of living patients. Regulatory agencies do not seem to make a strong distinction in usage of these two terms. EMA uses either word in guideline titles, uses them interchangeably. The FDA specifically chooses to use the word non-clinical with the disclaimer that these studies are often referred to as the preclinical studies when conducted before first in human clinical studies. So FDA gives a more nuanced definition in section 58.3 of GLP, uh, where non-clinical study means it's in vivo or in vitro experiments under laboratory conditions and does not include st studies utilizing human subjects and does not include basic exploratory studies. So many service providers use them interchangeably and there is no problem in doing so. So what are the general considerations for vaccine clinical development? We need to understand the indication, what for this product is um, developed. What is the safety profile? What is the efficacy profile? What is the disease incidence? What is the disease risk factor? 
what are the benefits to the individuals and the populations and what phases of clinical vaccine development are covered so these are the different phases of clinical trials phase 1 generally for safety uh, done in less than 100 uh, healthy adults and phase 2 is done and about few hundred subjects which mainly establishes safety plus a dose ranging efficacy and phase 3 is for mainly safety and then also efficacy and then you get a registration and then phase 4 is done for passive surveillance for safety gen- data generation and also for clinical trials uh, for booster applications for pregnancy registration for lot testing and we mentioned about tpp target product profile so what does it mean so in this you define what is unmet medical need what the disease is targeted against against is global regional or epidemiological status of the disease and then what are the target population depending on the age any special populations are also covered uh, what are the route of administration what is the schedule and what are the boosters if there is any need and what type of vaccine is produced and what does the implementation um, details means what is anticipated standard of care and what are the any future recommendations which might be targeted so this all will be covered in a target product profile and basically there are three steps in vaccine discovery the early discovery phase where you identify the target which is done through uh, this <clears throat> um figure here in the right where you have a pathogen genome sequence is done and then genes are identified the gene of interest is cloned into a recombinant construct and then after this you either go through decide to go through a dna vaccine mode or a subunit vaccines mode or a vector vaccines mode this is for uh, vaccines of these particular types if there is a whole uh, cell vaccine or it is a live adenovirus vaccine it's a different um, mode of platform generation so find the right antigen and then set the objective for the preventive tpp screening and progression criteria and then followed by initial screening then follows the cmc or vaccine bio process development phase where you have early product process development along with definition of the chemical and biological properties and then finally you have a early clinical pre clinical development phase where you have in vivo studies done you have bio distribution which is generally not done for vaccines and you have proof of concept and efficacy models established in animals and then your safety in animals and toxicology assessment is done so vaccines generally composed of an antigens and they may have immune potentiator they may also have a delivery systems and like adjuvants like alum if you can see in the right picture here you have an active component is an antigen which can be of any type and then you have excipients which are composed of adjuvants uh, stabilizers which protect the vaccine from harsh processing conditions antibiotics which may also be a, a part of trace component from residual components used in manufacture and you have preservatives which prevent contamination by use of uh multiple dose presentations during this uh, development manufacturing of vaccines four ground rules have to be kept in mind so vaccines must be developed produced and delivered in large volumes process costs must be kept down development and delivery times must be short and subject and employee safety should not be compromised so what are the adjuvants they improve uh, due to increasing refinement in vaccines uh, the unwanted side effect is that they reduce the immunogenicity because from whole cell vaccines to live attenuated vaccines to subunit vaccines there is a gradual decrease in the kind of immune responses it can generate so this can be remedied by addition of an adjuvant which is a substance which is added to a vaccine formulation which can enhance the immune responses of the desired type but the selection of a wrong adjuvant may render a particular vaccine antigen inadequate thus vaccine antigen must take into account adjuvant selection to avoid discarding potentially effective vaccine antigen candidates this must be kept in mind when you are checking an antigen adjuvant combination so there can be different vaccine technologies used as, as shown here and many of you are aware of it so everyone has uh, their own advantage and disadvantage like live attenuated vaccine is uh, it mimics natural infection but it may revert to a virulent form and risk to immune deficient patient inactivated vaccines they have minimal interference in circulating antibody they cannot replicate so they are safer uh, but they mostly induce humoral antibody response they may be an incomplete inactivation risk if not properly characterized and they may require periodic booster doses subunit vaccines are most safe but they are purely immunogenic and especially in simulating cellular responses to the many adjuvants in booster shots so this table gives you a development history of several different types of vaccine candidates and what are the status as you can see from the late 17th the 18th century many of the vaccine important technologies have been introduced and many of them are still used like the those which are uh, discovered in the early 1900s like toxoid based vaccines are still under use so what are the de- development elements need to be considered as we mentioned before tpp has to be defined we have to define the cqas and cpps for both drug product 
and drug substance. Drug substance is the active pharmaceutical ingredient in terms of pharma, which is the active component. And when it is formulated with other experience, it forms the drug product and it filled into the final container. Determining the quality attributes of the drug substance and excipients and, and uh, the drug product, selecting the appropriate manufacturing process along with defining what elements of the process need to be controlled to attain defined CQAs, what are the operating ranges for such elements needed to constantly yield acceptable product and where possible identifying a control strategy. So when CQAs are met, it will mean that the product is of desired quality and it is produced in a deproducible manner. So QBD is a concept where the product is designed to meet patient needs and the process is designed to meet consistently the CQAs. How it is done? First, you made a CQ assessment. What are the attributes needed to uh, analyze the product? And then make sure which are the current analytical methods to be used for checking these attributes. And what are these attributes which are critical and which are affected by a change in a critical process parameter change? And then based on this, you go back and then identify your three critical process parameters. And then you have to set the ranges for each of the critical parameter, process parameter, so that, and then go back and check what impact it has on the CPA. And then finally, when all these things are assessed, you finally make an yield assessment to make sure that at the required yield target, your process parameters also all meet the required critical quality and attributes. When all these things are finalized and you check any gaps for any of this implementation in assessment or either you need any relaxation in the parameters, and then you finally review the risks and graphs and generate an action plan for your uh, scale up or process development, further process development. So this is how the QBD works. And then as you can see in the picture here, the product quality, CPE, P and the CQA are all interlinked and they are all must be very well understood to make sure the process developed is robust and reproducible. So usually in a discovery lab, uh, at lab scale clinical production, the small scale material is produced to check the phase one, which is uh, proof of concept. And then you go to a phase one trial with a produced material produced at a small scale clinical production lot at GMP scale, mainly to check safety. And then you go through a process development cycle through a pilot scale process. And then at this scale, you make materials for phase two and then at full scale for phase three generally. And then the final large scale uh, manufacturing process is developed, uh, which is used for licensure and launch. So these are the different phases, as you can see. And then there are two problems which need to be overcome during this transition to meet regulatory requirements at each stage and to redesign the process so that each desired scale, it makes the same product as it was made originally in the laboratory. So economic considerations must also carefully shape the decision-making process at each step of process development to enable production of vaccine economically at large scale. Inadequate attention to process development can result in failure or abandonment of a good product through unforeseen manufacturing difficulties or unnecessarily high cost. This is important for you to remember. So usually the small scale development is a laboratory, which is about 100 to 1000 times lesser, which is done to understand the early definition of CQS. And then it moves to pilot scale where the scale should be relevant and discussed with concerned regulatory authority. It must balance parameters such as anticipated product volumes, anticipated site of production, equipment constraints and the site regulatory expectations. So your process should also uh, consider what are the platform which you are going to produce at full scale development and then all the optimization should be done at pilot scale to meet and uh, ensure that it is scalable at the full pilot scale production, which is done uh, for a phase three manufacturing and also for PV stage development. So what are the steps in by process scale up? You define the process product economics based on market size. And then you conduct laboratory studies and scale-up planning. Then you define uh, key controlling steps in the proposed process, conduct preliminary larger than laboratory studies with equipment, design and construct a pilot plant, including provisions for process and environmental controls and all the other accessory controls, evaluate pilot plant results. And this is how it progresses. If you go identification of critical unit operations during your initial process development and during scale-up, and then during process validation and engineering runs during phase one lots production, and then process definition studies and critical unit operations, they continue and there may be some definition or change in the process parameters due to scale up. And then the final manufacturing and product launch. So during tech transfer, all these process design, pilot plan studies, pilot lots and development studies, what is the scale you need to produce, process flow sheet, flow sheet and process analytics, all must be properly documented and transferred to the receiving lab. So this quickly gives you a 
overview of a timeline for discovery phase uh, these are the activities which are completed like initial poc understanding of the initial process needs takes about 5 to 10 years until preclinical and then early process development to prepare ind and then 1 to 3 years is for dp ds characterization process development and then non gmp manufacturing and up to phase 2 phase 3 gmp production and then finally phase 3 to perform process validation consistency lots and stability studies and also prepare biology licensing application for submission to nra and all these things takes up to 2 to 4 years and then final approval takes another year and this is the overall summary of activity so at the early process we have a very low process understanding but due to a successive analytical toolbox development implementation of in process assay structural functional relationship understanding and then the attributes understanding between product and processes we have a better understanding of vaccines so that we have a robust optimal processes developed at this at the end as you know it's a very complex process it involves so many steps starting from your serial culture and to final transport and up takes some 60 36 months depending on the vaccine candidate and most of this time is on quality control and the, those which are in the boxes are not used for all the vaccines they are used for specific vaccines if the process demands it and there are various challenges because the vaccines are very complex and they have very production and purification platform so difficult to standardize facility and small changes in process can lead to potential changes in the quality attributes and majority of vaccines are produced traditionally and they need very high quality production and testing is expensive so we have and they have very high regulatory demands so that we should always build in a risk management process from the beginning of the design stage and there is also practical and technical difficult uh, challenges as we said here depending on scale up requirement of separate pill finish for live vaccines unequal distribution technology you know how not owned by few uh, only owned by few companies and analytical assays with low throughput and the time to clinic and approval for process development and clinical are very high in summary vaccines are complex biomolecules they need large investments and time to develop they are given to healthy individuals needing careful risk benefit considerations process is treated as a product and change of scale up is mostly not linear or symmetrical hence it is a challenge to develop modify or scale up process and prove that the purity quality and safety of the product are not impacted those several stages of clinical testing identification sequence and the monitoring during production process helps to maintain the antigenicity immunogenicity and safety and building and maintenance of premises equipment deployment of qualified trained personnel concurrent documentation of activities with within the predefined procedures and applicable guidelines following risk management approach or keys in implementing the maintaining gmp the final goal of the development and manufacturing pathways chosen and implemented should be to have a robust scalable reproducible cost effective process that produces a safe effective vaccine following G gmp regulations that's all and then there are subsequent appendices which gives you more information on general consideration for scale up and also for different type of stock studies done thank you okay now we have a list of questions uh, from this talk which i'll be taking up as per the time permits uh, i think we have about 5 minutes so for the first question is as per your experience which vaccine development pathways could be the shortest so i think the newer technologies based on the mrna based platforms they are the quickest as we have seen because of the time needed to produce uh, the construct and verify it and then take it for manufacturing but the rest of the phases like starting from your uh, process development scale up and then the clinical subsequent clinical pathways they are all very similar for all the things so i think except for the initial phase where you have the shortest time for the mrna vaccines the other timelines are almost identical for most of the vaccines i think that's what i think is a right answer for that the second question is covid-19 vaccine sped up trials of vaccines do you think this is a safe and is there anything we can learn from this expedited pro progress for future emerging pandemics might we see shortened periods of trials as a result of what we are facing today with covid-19 actually covid-19 has uh, the heightened the awareness of many regulators on the some of the shortcomings of the existing uh, setups so i think this has made them to think on different aspects to speed up the scrutiny of the data Uh, scrutiny of the clinical trial results how they can do a intermittent uh, um, review of the results and so that they can speed up the approvals i think main thing here is i think the correlates of protection if that is the one which probably yesterday also dr stanley plotkin spoke about it in one of his lectures 
if this is clearly established, then it will help us to uh, help the regulators to um, get the uh, approvals faster. But uh, more than this, I think for this question, uh, the better answer can be given by people who are actually the clinical trial experts. So I think maybe tomorrow, if the same question is asked to the, some of the experts, I think they can you can give a better answer for that. Um, there was one other question: uh, What kind of newer generation technology will be practically useful? to fight the mutant variant of viruses? Will it be more effective than the older technology ones? Uh, I don't think there is any um, specific technology which will be more useful than the others. Uh, they almost have the same kind of efficacy as the current uh, results which we are seeing with different platforms, uh, vaccines in the clinical trials. Uh, so there is nothing which you can give other than uh, getting a, f a faster way of getting the product, product into market like based on mRNA technology because you can make the new constructs based on the variant in the uh, strains and then you can bring it quickly to the market. Uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So another question which probably I would like to answer is with the COVID-19 vaccine, we have seen different vaccines come at varying prices. What components of the vaccine development is responsible for the high cost of some vaccines and what alternatives are available. So there are different components as you have seen in one of my slides. Uh, there is a drug substance, there is a drug product and drug product has sovereign experience. Especially for mRNA based vaccines, the main cost is actually the formulation cost, which involves a lot of liposomes uh, has to be made and then that needs a lot of technology, new technology and a lot of synthetic chemicals to be used. And also the final cold chain shipment and the, the because they need high uh, low temperature freezing. So all these components actually cost uh, in the manufacturing also and also logistics and transporting the vaccine to the final shipment. So the different components have different price uh, uh, percentages in different vaccine platforms. As you can see, generally uh, the thumb rule is uh, the drug substance manufacturing costs about 20% and the drug product uh, manufacturing costs around uh, 30 to 40% and then the QC testing costs cost around 40%. This is the regular, uh, the, the normal range for the different components prices in the manufacturing part alone. I think, do we have time for one more question? Uh, I think, okay. Oh, so one last question probably I would like to answer is, what are the challenges that are faced during scale up, especially with respect to yields? I think I have mentioned that in one of the slides. Um, again, again, on different platforms, this, um, as I mentioned, there are scale dependent factors, there are scale independent factors. The scale dependent factors are the ones which one we need to take into account while, because they are the most impacted on the CPPs and CQAs. Uh, which also will have an impact on the yield. So these are the things which one has to take care, especially, uh, again, this varies from platform to platform. Okay, so I think uh, we have to move to the next lecture. Uh, welcome to Dr. Nikolai Petrovsky. Uh, he'll be talking on vaccine, COVID vaccines and the adjuvants. So we'll go to the next lecture and we'll follow that with Q&A. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction, and it's a great pleasure to be presenting to this meeting hosted by IVI. Uh, today I'm going to talk uh, about our company vaccine and the work that we've been doing in developing vaccine adjuvants over the last 20 years uh, in association with our work on developing pandemic uh, vaccines, uh, particularly focused on pandemic influenza but also uh, pandemic coronaviruses, including SARS, MERS, and, and most recently COVID-19. Um, and so I'm try, going to try and present uh, our work in adjuvants in the context of uh, COVID-19 program. So starting with the first slide. So my company, Vaccine, uh, has been developing vaccine adjuvants and vaccine technologies for the last 20 years. Uh, our mission is, is to use knowledge of uh, the immune system to prevent uh, both infectious disease, but also for treatment of other diseases, including cancer and, and allergy, uh, using this expertise. Um, and our big strength comes from the fact that although we're a small company, we have partners uh, around the world with which we work to 
execute these uh, vaccine uh, programs. As I mentioned, the company is almost 20 years old. Uh, we, we originally started uh, very much with a focus on adjuvants and vaccine delivery approaches, uh, but more recently we've expanded uh, our focus into developing uh, both vaccine antigens as well as adjuvants. Uh, we, we've done a lot of work in recent years to apply artificial intelligence uh, to design of both our vaccine antigens and adjuvants. Uh, and, and over this time, we've been very fortunate uh, to have had funding support from the US uh, government National Institutes of Health uh, which has allowed us uh, to focus on uh, particularly uh, pandemic vaccine platforms. Um, so I'm the, the founder of Vaccine. Uh, my background is as a, a medical doctor, but also uh, a PhD in, in, in immunology. Um, and, and so for the last 20 years, I've been uh, the research director for Vaccine, uh, really trying to apply uh, our knowledge of the immune system uh, to development of a pandemic vaccine and, and most recently to develop uh, a vaccine against uh, COVID-19, which I'll tell you about a little later. Um, so in terms of uh, our, our focus, uh, it's very much on infectious disease. Uh, as I've mentioned, we've worked in the field of influenza for many years, uh, respiratory syncytial virus and Japanese encephalitis. Uh, but these are only a small number of the, the, the infectious disease programs uh, that we're working on. And behind all of these vaccines are, are innovative adjuvants, uh, which have been developed from polysaccharides, uh, but also from uh, human toll-like receptor uh, agonists. So really, I guess our, our expertise is in the field of pandemic vaccine development, uh, in the field of novel adjuvants, uh, and also in um, the, the specifically in developing uh, coronavirus and influenza vaccines. And, and we're focused on this area because pandemics are inevitable. Uh, approximately every 20 years or so, uh, you know, as humans, we were exposed to a potential pandemic uh, virus. Uh, whether it comes from influenza or it's a coronavirus uh, or, or one of these large number of other viruses which we know are highly lethal in humans, uh, which could cause the, the next pandemic. Um, so when we look at, at vaccines, and I'm particularly focused on either recombinant protein or inactivated viral vaccines, uh, then what we know is that the antigens themselves are very important, and, and this is just showing you uh, a negative stain electron microscopy of our spike protein uh, antigen for, for COVID-19. So the structure of the protein antigen is very critical, but what we also know is that if you just have a pure protein, uh, then generally it's not very immunogenic un unless you have uh, an adjuvant formulated with it and it's only when you combine the antigen with the adjuvant uh, that you get a highly uh, effective vaccine. Uh, again, just showing you uh, current uh, COVID-19 uh, formulation. So because it's topical, I thought rather than just speak about adjuvants generally, I would speak about them in the context of COVID vaccines. Uh, as you'll be aware, there are a number of technologies being used around the world uh, for development of vaccines against COVID. Uh, the very earliest uh, vaccines were inactivated whole virus vaccines, uh, predominantly produced in China and, and India. And, and obviously this is a very traditional approach um, again, inactivated uh, viruses typically uh, require an adjuvant, and, and in most cases, these have been formulated with uh, aluminium uh, hydroxide uh, adjuvant. Uh, but what we know is that in that um, formulation is these vaccines have typically been uh, relatively, uh, have, have had relatively low immunogenicity, uh, maybe not as strong as some of the other technologies which have inbuilt adjuvants, particularly the RNA vaccines um, or, or the uh, live uh, uh, 
uh, adenoviral uh, vector vaccine such as the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, there is a, a, a DNA vaccine platforms uh, that are being developed, although as yet we haven't um, seen any uh, a data, uh, phase three data from, from those programs, so we still don't know how effective they're going to be. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you have the recombinant protein-based uh, vaccines, of which ours uh, is, is one of the uh, key examples. Also, there's recombinant protein uh, vaccines from uh, Novavax and Sanofi, which are all uh, progressing through clinical trials, although as yet uh, we don't have an approved one. And of course, rec being recombinant proteins, these are all highly dependent uh, on adjuvants to be effective. Uh, in our, our uh, COVID vaccine, we have a unique uh, polysaccharide ADVAX uh, adjuvant. Uh, Novavax have a, a saponin adjuvant uh, derived from uh, tree bark, and Sanofi are using an adjuvant uh, ASO3 uh, that's produced by uh, a GSK, uh, which is a, a, a basically a, a squalene uh, based emulsion adjuvant. Um, so adjuvants are obviously clearly very important uh, to recombinant uh, protein-based vaccines. And I'm not going to go again into um, all of the issues of the different technologies um, that we've encountered in, in the last uh, 12 months or so, uh, but suffice to say that the inactivated viral vaccines, which are using traditional adjuvants that had weak immunogenicity, um, there's, there's uh, been issues, obviously, with safety concerns with the adenoviral vector platforms, uh, as we've seen. Uh, mRNA has been very uh, successful and has been the, the most successful class of new uh, vaccines, but still they do have some side effects in including myocarditis and pericarditis in occasionally uh, in, in young men and also have issues of cold chain uh, due to their instability and need to be st stored frozen. So we still believe that there's a, a major need for recombinant protein-based vaccines uh, for COVID-19 and the advantage is because of their unique adjuvants, uh, these should be very potently immunogenic uh, contrasting them with the inactivated uh, viral uh, vaccines. Um, so what, what we know now about COVID-19 is that some of the existing vaccine technologies are starting to wear off. And uh, this is just a comment from Professor Chris Whitty, who's England's chief medical officer, uh, saying that he feels that we're going to need to move forward into boosting uh, uh, particularly against the many variants uh, that are, are starting to rise in COVID-19. So just coming to our design uh, for our COVID-19 vaccine, essentially this is a polyvalent uh, vaccine. Um, so it's designed to protect against all of the, the variants. Uh, because of its adjuvant, uh, uh, it's designed to have a strong antibody and T-cell response. Uh, and at, at, it's one of the few vaccines that's actually been able to, sh to block uh, virus transmission in animal models. And, and again, because it's a protein-based approach, it's able to be stored under normal refrigeration, which means it's easy uh, to distribute, uh, including in low-income uh, countries. So I'm not going to so much talk about the platform itself. Uh, we produce the recombinant protein using a baclovirus system uh, to transfect insect cells. So it's a transient transfection. Uh, we then purify the recombinant protein uh, from the culture supernatant. And then finally, uh, we formulate it with our Advax adjuvant uh, and give it as an intramuscular uh, injection. So, so this is really just showing diagrammatically how we go from the genome sequence of the virus to identify the spike protein we clone it into the baclovirus, we use that to transfect the insect cells, and then we purify the protein uh, from the culture supernatant, we formulate it with the adjuvant, and that gives the final vaccine. Um, obviously, because we're doing protein engineering here, uh, we're dealing with a recombinant protein, 
Uh, we have to modify the protein sequence of the spike protein to make it more stable. For instance, we remove the furin cleavage site, but it also gives us the opportunity to insert uh, mutations into the protein sequence uh, to, to tackle the, the various variants that uh, have arisen. Um, and then we express this as a recombinant protein. So you can see it's a, it's a single length uh, protein on, on gel. Uh, it assembles into a trimeric structure as shown uh, by these cone-shaped structures on negative stain EM. Uh, and then we formulate it uh, with our adjuvant, which makes it look like a milky white um, solution. So I'm not going to present all the data today because in the interest of time, but, but uh, I'll show you just briefly some of the data we have uh, generated in animal models. Uh, and uh, at this stage, our vaccine has just moved, uh, just completed phase two clinical trials in 400 subjects and has just moved to a, a phase three clinical trial. But this slide is really just to, to show the importance of an adjuvant uh, to a COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Uh, so this is just a mouse immunogenicity study. So mice have been immunized with the spike protein alone without an adjuvant. Uh, and then that's been mixed with our ADVEX adjuvant. And what you can see is there's a marked uh, increase in the antibody production in response to addition of the adjuvant. And then if you look at cellular immunity, you can see the adjuvants having a very marked uh, effect on increasing the memory CD4 T cell population uh, in both uh, black six and MALPC mice, uh, and, and, and similarly increasing the frequency of memory CD8 uh, T cells in both strains of mice compared to the unadjuvanted uh, antigen. So obviously the adjuvant is very important to the immunogenicity of the vaccine. And we also see that if we look at neutralizing antibody titers, they're higher in the presence of the adjuvant than uh, without the adjuvant. If we look at the memory T cells, uh, we can see that the adjuvant is increasing the amount of Th1 cytokines, particularly IL-2 and gamma interferon, uh, when compared to mice immunized with protein alone. But similarly, it enhances the Th2 cytokines so IL-4 and IL-6 similarly are increased. And then when we go to a challenge model, so this is a, a challenge study in ferrets, uh, what we see is that uh, not only can we protect the lungs of the ferrets against the, the COVID-19 infection, uh, but we can also see that even at day three post-challenge, uh, there's no recoverable virus in the noses of the animals, uh, which would suggest that these animals should no longer be able to transmit the infection. Um, but as I mentioned, uh, the, the focus in the last six months has moved uh, to the variants. And, uh, and so we've been very focused on how do we maximise protection uh, using our vaccine against all of these new variants uh, that have arisen uh, over the last uh, six months. Um, and, and to do that, in, in essence, what we've been doing is developing uh, uh, recombinant proteins for the major variants uh, and then testing how they perform in combination uh, with the adjuvant. And what we're seeing is that we're getting very broad uh, neutralization of the different virus strains. Uh, and at the moment, we're conducting a, a challenge study in hamsters uh, of our multivariant vaccine uh, 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 right now. And so over the next few weeks, we should see um, just how that strategy is working in terms of broadening the protection of COVID vaccines, both using the adjuvant to broaden the, uh, the breadth of the vaccine, but also using additional uh, variant proteins to, to give even further broadening uh, to, to that uh, response. So just to, to finish, I would like to uh, acknowledge all the help we've had um, from a whole range of academic centres uh, around the world uh, to help us in both developing the adjuvant but also the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, obviously, to acknowledge our funders, particularly the uh, US National Institutes of Health uh, and Innovate UK, who've 
uh, provided funding for for the the work that I've described today, and then a whole range of industry partners uh, who again have uh, been uh, supporting uh, our programs. So um, I, I think just to to finish to say COVID nineteen is obviously very important right now, but. Uh, when you look at the utility of adjuvants, uh, there are obviously a whole range of uh, diseases that still don't have uh, vaccine solutions. And, and so uh, a lot of what we're doing in the background is also applying our adjuvant uh, to all of these different uh, vaccine platforms, uh, you know, either internally or through partnerships. So, so adjuvants obviously are very important, um, and uh, I think particularly so in COVID-19 vaccines, I think they'll be shown to be critical uh, to, to getting a high level of, of protection. Um, and uh, so going forward, I, I think there's also opportunities to apply the same adjuvant approaches to improve uh, vaccines against uh, cancer, uh, allergy, uh, we're working with a U.S. group on an Alzheimer's vaccine uh, and another U.S. group on a vaccine against a drug addiction and particularly uh, opioids. So I think that, uh, again, uh, you know, adjuvants have, have a, a very promising future now, uh, particularly now that we've seen uh, the benefits they can deliver to, to a pandemic uh, a vaccine. So uh, I'll just uh, finish there and I'm happy to uh, take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Nikolai. It was an excellent presentation. And uh, I have a few questions already from the uh, participants. I think uh, we can go with the question number one. How do adjuvants aid in triggering the non-specific mediators and cells to kill specific antigenic targets? Given the mutation capability of viruses, is it possible to focus on non-specific immunity to neutralize mutated viruses when designing vaccines, since we see that the neutralizing antibodies may not be able to continue to do the same for emerging strains of COVID-19's case? It's a good question. Um, and. Uh, I guess, you know, this is referring to the ability to stimulate innate immunity to give non-specific protection. Um, unfortunately, although that can be done um, using, for instance, toll-like receptor agonists, uh, the effects are quite short-lived, um, usually only a, a week or two after they're administered. So it's really only by stimulating a, a adaptive immune response that, that you can hope to get long-term uh, protection. Uh, so I think if we're talking about mutation and variant viruses, a, a better approach than trying to recruit innate immunity is to actually um, broaden the adaptive immune response. And, and, and we've been able to show with our adjuvant and some other people have been able to show that adjuvants do play a role in broadening the antibody uh, repertoire and also the T cell repertoire uh, against the specific antigen, and that gives uh, better protection. Thank you, Professor Nikolai. Can you please turn your video on if possible so that people can see you when you answer it? Yes, it, it's actually saying that it's disabled uh, at, at your end. Um, so they would need to give me the uh, ability to switch it on. Okay, okay, we'll do that. Yeah, thank you. So the second question is, is there a way to quantify the non-specific immune responses contribution to neutralizing antigenic targets? So again, I think this is um, referring to non-specific uh, targeting. And um, as I say, the real role of an adjuvant is to enhance the, the adaptive immune response um, rather than the innate immune response. Okay. So there was another question, probably it is not directly related to your topic, but just in case, is there a risk of vaccine DNA integrating into human genomes later, years later? 
இப்படி செட் இன் திஸ் இஸ் பீன் समथिंग தட்ஸ் பீன் டிஸ்கஸ்ட் அட் அட் கிரேட் லெन्थ um in respect of dna vaccines but there's also been a more recent question in respect of mrna vaccines um you know there is at least theoretical evidence that uh mrna if in the presence of a reverse transcriptase uh which can be induced by a viral infection uh, may get integrated into the host genome but um as i say that's more theoretical i haven't seen any you know direct evidence that that is happening in people receiving mrna vaccines thank you i thought, uh, thought so so i think we have time for one or two more questions um is it possible to reduce the anti vector immunity during booster vaccination for covid-19 using heterologous vector for booster dose or using only one dose yes this is again a very good question um and and we've seen um you know the russian sputnik vaccine actually demonstrate uh the use of uh two different uh, adeno vectors um uh one for the prime and one for the boost um so that's the rationale behind that strategy um that compares for instance with astrazeneca and johnson and johnson who have been giving prime and uh and boost uh with the same vector um if if you leave the time between the vectors long enough and and we've seen this with AstraZeneca they they found out by mistake um that if they delayed the second dose of the same vector by 12 weeks it actually gave a much better response than if they gave it um earlier at 4 weeks um and and so uh yes the problem is that anti vector immunity when it's strong will reduce the effect of the second dose but it does appear that maybe you can uh at least partially circumvent that by increasing the time interval thank you uh i think we have one last question um uh, when you say polyvalent does it mean that it has epitopes against the various covid variants currently in circulation or the variants in highly variable with respect to the rbd Uh, sorry could you just repeat that question yeah yeah when you say polyvalent i think this is with relevant to your topic with lecture when you say polyvalent does it mean that it has epitopes against various covid variants currently in circulation or the variants currently variable with respect to the rbd yes yeah, so so it it means that it it actually has um uh, several proteins each corresponding to a particular variant and so when you formulate those proteins together you get a much broader uh, immune response uh, against the variants and it's very similar to current seasonal influenza vaccines where obviously we add four components together to cover all the different influenza strains so i think ultimately that's probably where we're going to end up with covid vaccines as well uh, with multivalent uh, formulations Thank you Professor Nikolai I think it was great having you here and thanks you for giving your time for Q&A I think uh, if you have some time you can just browse through some of the questions which we don't have time to answer here and then give in your answer Thank you very much It's so, a pleasure thank you We'll go to the next lecture of the uh, day uh, by Dr Hanek uh, it's on vector based covid-19 vaccine Dr Hanek please My name is Hanneke Schuitemaker and I'm working at Janssen uh, Vaccines and Prevention uh, located in the Netherlands and uh, we are part of uh, Janssen Pharmaceuticals and Johnson and Johnson and I will present today uh, on our progress with the development uh, of our COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, so let me share my screen. Um so these are my disclosures uh the declaration of where we get funding and our confidentiality notice. Uh from the beginning of uh, last year like uh, a lot of others we have been working on the development of a covid-19 vaccine and in this slide uh we we only capture uh part of the, all the activities in green that happened within uh, Janssen vaccines uh, on the the highlights and also the path um uh, through uh phase 1 and 3 studies 
to the emergency use authorization uh, and uh, uh, conditional market authorization and um, uh, approval by WHO in the spring of this year. And after that, of course, the uh, rollout of our vaccine started. To give you a little bit of background on uh, our vaccine, we are making use of the uh, EdVac technology, which is uh, a vaccine platform uh, where we deliver immunogens as transgenes that are being expressed in vivo in the body, and we deliver these through adenoviral vectors. So when you look at the adenovirus genome, uh, we have deleted two genes, the early uh, gene one and three, and through that, the uh, virus has become replication incompetent, but it also creates room for a transgene. And in case of the COVID-19 vaccine, this is a transgene that's encoding for uh, the spike uh, protein. We use a complementing cell line to produce these factors because uh, a deletion of E1 and E3, as said, makes them replication incompetent. And uh, we uh, grow this cell line in medium that is free of uh, animal components. For the design of the spike protein, we looked at multiple designs. So we varied the signal peptide. We uh, uh, looked at the impact of uh, the furin uh, cleavage site, so knocked it out or left it intact, and applied the double proline mutation for increased stabilization. And uh, all these, uh, um, the DNA encoding for these different formats of uh, the spike protein were put in these adeno26 uh, vectors so we have multiple vectors uh, being tested and we observed that there indeed uh, was a difference uh, in between these designs and that the uh, purine knockout cleavage site in combination with the double pro limitation gave uh, a, a spike protein that had a much better ability to bind to the ACE2 receptor and this also uh, panned out in increased immunogenicity, as demonstrated here in the non-human primate study, where we analyzed the immunogenicity after a single dose of vaccine, and where we observed that, uh, especially this design, so with the knockout uh, of the furin cleavage site and the double proline stabilizing mutation, gave optimal uh, immunogenicity, both in uh, binding antibodies, and, but more specifically in the neutralizing antibodies. So this, was our lead candidate from now on called f 26 uh, cov 2 s We then looked whether this uh, variant had uh, the ability to protect in non-clinical models. And indeed, this uh, turned out to be the case. So uh, monkeys were vaccinated and challenged with uh, SARS-CoV-2 six weeks later. And here you can see in control animals that we had very good take of uh, varemia, uh, of, of the virus inoculum uh, reflected in varemia in both uh, the lungs and in the nose, whereas in uh, animals that were vaccinated with f 26 cop 2 s uh, we did not see any sign of uh, varemia in the lung, and only one out of six animals had transient varemia in the nose. This uh, uh, encouraged us to start uh, a phase one, two-way study, where we enrolled uh, younger adults uh, aged 18 to 55 uh, years and uh, older adults uh, in a cohort three, uh, which were adults above 65 years of age. And we tested uh, the immunogenicity of a single dose of f 26 cov 2 s at a 5 times 10 to the 10th virus particle or a 1 times 10 to the 11th virus particle dose. Or we tested a two dose regimen uh, with an eight week interval. Uh, separately, uh, we are studying uh, the impact of boosting, and uh, I will uh, come back to that later. So these are the, the neutralizing antibody uh, data after the first and second dose in the younger adults. So here you can see that after a single dose, we see uh, very uh, nice uh, responses uh, detectable four weeks after, or first measured four weeks after a vaccination and that are uh, very stable. And in this experiment, we went up to day 71, but I will show a uh, longer durability of our responses uh, later in the presentation. And here you can see the impact of the second dose eight weeks later that we indeed see further increase of the uh, neutralizing antibodies. This is with the dose that we in the end uh, tested in uh, phase three studies, but that was decided based on the fact that the higher dose, the one times 10 to the 11th, did not show really much higher uh, immune responses uh, in this uh, cohort. Uh, also in our elderly cohort, uh, we uh, already did first measurement two weeks after a vaccination, and you will appreciate that also in this uh, age group, we had very nice uh, neutralizing antibody responses, 
uh, that uh, uh, get up till day 29. And also for this group, we have uh, uh, longer durability data by now than, than only the four weeks. Um, four weeks after vaccination, we also had uh, uh, good signs of, of uh, T cell responses of, that, in fact, were already detectable two weeks after vaccination. So, uh, both in the younger and older animals, we had very nice responder rates for uh, CD4 positive T cells and also uh, for CD8 positive T cells. The, for the CD4 compartment, the T helper 1, T helper 2 ratio was well above 1, which gives uh, uh, a decreasing of the theoretical risk of uh, enhanced respiratory disease, which is associated with the reverse ratio. And uh, based on all this immunogenicity data, the regimen uh, that was selected for phase three clinical study ensemble was a single dose of five times 10 to the 10 virus particles of at 26 cov 2 s Now, as uh, of course, what became uh, more uh, important over time was of course durability. Uh, so in this uh, sub-cohort of our cohort one, we uh, could measure the, the um, humoral immune responses eight months after uh, the single dose uh, vaccination or uh, in this small cohort, uh, the two dose regimen. And you can see that uh, the, uh, irrespective of regimen, that there was good durability uh, for eight months uh, post uh, vaccination. But also what is very critical is that the immune responses cover also the uh, variants of concern that have emerged uh, since then. And uh, of course, the, the, the ones that are uh, getting most attention are the uh, beta variant and the delta variant. And you can see here that neutralization is uh, very well uh, uh, preserved uh, over that time frame. And what is interesting, so we, we also measured neutralization against variants on day 29. And you can see that there, uh, we see uh, less coverage of the variants. And this indicates that over time after single dose uh, vaccination, that there clearly is a maturation of the humoral immune response, improving the, the coverage of uh, variants of concerns as well. Um, this uh, 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 good coverage of variants was also seen in the T-cell compartment here shown uh, by uh, very good coverage of all variants that were tested at the time uh, for CD8 T cell uh, epitopes and, and CD8 T cell recognition, and also for the CD4 compartment. So in the phase three study, as said, we uh, tested a single dose uh, of, of F26 COV2S at a five times 10 to the 10 virus particle versus uh, placebo. We uh, enrolled adults uh, above 18 years of age and in, uh, in the end had enrolled uh, around 44,000 uh, participants. And uh, the uh, endpoint in the, in the study was uh, molecularly confirmed severe critical COVID-19 in individuals who were seronegative at baseline. These are the countries that, uh, from, uh, that participated uh, in the study and you will appreciate that we were doing this study and are doing still this study on three different continents, uh, including uh, uh, North America, South America, and uh, South uh, Africa, which is on the African continent, obviously. So in this uh, uh, slide, you can see the uh, top uh, results from this uh, phase three study. So we overall had a uh, 66% uh, efficacy against moderate to severe critical COVID-19 across all countries. And please keep in mind that uh, during our study, uh, we were faced with the emergence of the uh, uh, beta variant in South Africa, which may have uh, uh, reduced uh, a little bit the vaccine efficacy. And that is, is indeed uh, uh, sort of supported by the fact that we had an overall 72% vaccine efficacy when we looked at uh, cases in the United States alone, where at that time, uh, only the uh, original Wuhan strain was uh, still circulating and that uh, in the US we enrolled a population of 19,000. We had high efficacy against severe COVID-19, uh, uh, also in, in the US, uh, and this uh, uh, high efficacy was uh, consistent across uh, regions. Uh, also in South Africa, where the, uh, the beta variant was highly prevalent uh, already at, the, at that time. And uh, vaccination gave complete protection against COVID-19 related hospitalizations and COVID-19 related uh, death in the uh, vaccinated group. Um, we did not see differences in vaccine efficacy between age groups, uh, people with or without uh, comorbidities, uh, and also 
uh, similar efficacy uh, independent of sex, race and ethnicity. So focusing in a little bit on the three uh, countries that have the largest uh, enrollment. Uh, so you can see here the in light blue the vaccine efficacies get against our uh, moderate to severe critical uh, endpoint and in darker blue, the efficacy against severe critical. So as just mentioned, we see this across the different continents. In South Africa, we uh, managed to sequence a large proportion of the cases and uh, in line with the uh, 95% uh, or the prevalence of the beta variant at the time, we also observed that in the cases in our trial, and still we had this uh, about 81% efficacy and full protection against hospitalization and uh, COVID-19 related death in, in South Africa. So these data supported the approval in, in US, Europe, and also by the WHO for the use of a single dose uh, COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and uh, more recently, the uh, efficacy data were confirmed in the so-called Sisonki trial where uh, a single dose of our F26 CoV-2S gave 71% uh, efficacy against hospitalization and uh, uh, almost complete protection against uh, COVID-19 related death uh, in a time where the, the Delta variant had become uh, most prevalent in this area. So this is a really uh, very important uh, additional data from a sort of real world evidence uh, study. Of course, the Janssen vaccine has also been in the news because of uh, safety signals and uh, uh, the, the review by the ACIP uh, group uh, clearly demonstrates that uh, uh, if you look at cases of uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome or uh, TTS, so thrombosis with uh, thrombocytopenia syndrome, uh, that the benefits of our vaccine to protect against COVID-19 hospitalizations and death uh, clearly outweigh uh, the risks in, uh, in age groups in, in current uh, state of the pandemic. In summary on this, uh, we, we did um, receive, of course, the, the, or observed the signal and were also notified of the signal. We have worked on uh, information so that uh, cases with uh, Guillain-Barre and uh, TTS are uh, receiving uh, the, the right uh, treatment so that, that physicians are well informed about the syndrome and can uh, apply the, the right uh, patient handling and uh, also label updates uh, should uh, support uh, that work. And uh, we are uh, really monitoring very closely and working with medical experts and global health authorities to keep uh, awareness of, of this uh, syndrome. I would like to end with thanking all our external partners and the uh, huge Janssen teams that have been involved in this work and uh, last but not least, I would really like to thank all the participants in, in our clinical trials, without whom we would not have been able to uh, bring this uh, vaccine for use to uh, populations in need. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hanek, for your nice presentation. Uh, just wanted to check with you. Yeah, your, your video is on. Thank you. So we can go for the questions now. The first question is... Um, how long j, j vaccine protection last, provided j, j has a single dose regime? Yes, thank you for the, the question. So we are still uh, following up in our phase three uh, efficacy studies to hopefully get an idea of, of uh, durability of, of um, uh, efficacy. Uh, those uh, analysis are currently ongoing and of course uh, the conduct Conducting these clinical trials in a time where uh, vaccines became available was, of course, challenging because it has uh, reduced the, um, uh, the the period in which there was a placebo control group. Right, so 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 we we really need to look carefully at uh, the, uh, timing of crossover in our trials and and to see what what we can learn there. Uh, so um, we have. Uh, if we look at the immune responses, uh, we see that uh, these are pretty stable for at least uh, a six to eight months. And if you extrapolate that to the levels that we had uh, immediately after vaccination, we would expect uh, that uh, vaccine-mediated uh, protection is, is also uh, durable for, for that period of time. Thank you for your answer. And I think the second question is probably related. You might have answered some part of it in your previous question. But if you can add something to this, 
what factors are considered when determining the dosage for J and J vaccines? Yes, so in, in our uh, phase one to a study, we uh, tested two dose levels, and that was also based on experience in uh, other programs. So where we use the same F26 platform for vaccines against other uh, diseases. Uh, and uh, as uh, the data showed us uh, here, there was no difference in the magnitude of the immune response between the, the 5 times 10 to the 10th and the 1 times 10 to the 11th virus particle at dose level, uh, also not in, in elderly. And uh, so based on, on that finding, in combination with the slightly higher reactogenicity with the higher dose, uh, we decided at the time to uh, proceed with the the lower vaccine dose, which is quite in line with what we are using in our other programs. Thank you. So I think we, the next question probably is, uh, is uh, how do you select the vector? It means what factors you considered while selecting your vector, the adenoviral vector? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, how, how did you select the vector used for the vaccine construct? Is there any specific factor you considered while choosing this? Yes, so, so we have uh, experience with uh, uh, adeno 26, so which is a vector based on the uh, serotype 26 adenovirus. And we have selected this one because it has very low seroprevalence uh, in the population. And after experiences of other companies with adeno 5, where the seroprevalence in the population is high and where interference with pre existing immunity uh, and vaccine take was observed, we have invested in the development of Adeno26. Interestingly, uh, in, in our phase three uh, study, also for COVID, uh, we checked whether uh, zero prevalence in the area for F26 uh, had any impact on vaccine take uh, or immunogenicity, and we did not observe uh, uh, an impact. So even when people are uh, zero positive for Adeno26, the antibody titers are uh, low and uh, not interfering with uh, uh, vaccine immunogenicity uh, um, for F26, uh, F26-based vaccine immunogenicity. Thank you. So uh, another question probably slightly related uh, to your field, but probably you can answer this. Uh, is the mechanism of how viral vector vaccines cause thrombosis with thrombocytopenia fully understood? Um, unfortunately, uh, not. Uh, we are uh, working on that question ourselves and also in collaboration with um, external experts. Um, we, uh, of course, are looking into obvious uh, things uh, and, and also trying to exclude obvious uh, things. So if, if there is mimicry uh, between uh, 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 the vaccine and, and the reaction that we see in, in TTS and also looking whether uh, um, the, the rarity of the uh, disease, if, if that's only the, the tip of the iceberg, or whether we could see already uh, similar phenomena in, in uh, people who do not develop the, the full syndrome. But th that is not the case. So it, of course, the rarity of the disease is, is fortunate. Uh, but of course, it really complicates uh, the research on the mechanism of action. But we, we are um, doing all we can to, to better understand. Thank you. Probably one last question. Any current investigation of the Janssen vaccine um, for uh, variants of concern with any different constructs? Yeah, so, so uh, the, the, the immunogenicity data that I showed uh, does not really urge us to update our vaccine. Uh, we see uh, good broadening of the immune response, uh, also covering uh, the, the variants of concern that are circulating uh, to up, up to now. Um, and uh, we are, of course, uh, constantly monitoring to, to see whether at a certain point an update uh, will be needed. Uh, but that's uh, until now that has not been uh, has not been a decision that, uh, that, that was made. Um. Thank you, Dr. Hanek, I think, for your presence and uh, availability for this Q&A session. Um, have a good day. And then if you can, possible, check the, some of the questions probably in the panel. And then if you can answer a few of the, I think it would be great. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on to the fourth lecture of the evening today. It will be by Dr. Mark Page on laboratory assessment of vaccines. Dr. Mark.
Hello, my name is Dr. Mark Page. I uh, am from the UK, from the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control, uh, at which we um, make, uh, I have responsibility for making uh, international standards for, um, for a variety of emerging diseases and pathogens uh, under the auspices of the World Health Organization. And I'm talking to you today about uh, assay development and assays used for SARS-CoV-2 vaccines uh, in the laboratory. And I'll touch uh, on um, ways that the various methods that can be used to, to assess those, um, the immune responses as well as the vaccine components themselves. And I will also talk about validation of assays and, um, and also standardization of those assays. So um, next slide, please. So the scope of this presentation, as I've alluded to, will cover the assessment of the immune responses by a variety of assays that I've listed here that include both uh, antibody responses and T cell responses. Um, and, uh, and looking at the quantification of that response in terms of vaccine efficacy. Uh, and then also I'll touch a little bit on the ass assessment of vaccine product, uh, the um, CMC part of the um, of assay development and uh, the lot and batch release uh, process that um, we at NIBS do for uh, market and authorization of vaccine products. And largely that will focus on identity and potency assays. What I will touch on also is talking about um, the need for validation and qualification of those assays, and particularly looking at linearity, precision, sensitivity and specificity of the assays, the um, quality control um, components of that, and, uh, and also importantly, standardization and calibration of those assays. Next slide, please. So there are, there are a large number of assays that have been developed for SARS-CoV-2, um, over 200, in fact, from commercial developers. And um, they, they fall into these um, various groups. So for, for um, antibody assays, we have binding assay formats, which are largely ELISA-type formats, but they're also high-throughput devices, such as Luminex and Mesoscale discovery systems. And essentially, they are uh, coating the antigen on a solid surface and uh, adding the antibody test sample or antibody from a clinical trial patient or a vaccine recipient uh, against that protein and then detecting the amount of, pro of antibody that binds to that protein. And those proteins are mainly focused on the spike protein for vaccines because most of the vaccines that have been developed are spike protein focused, although others are in development that are whole inactivated vaccines. But we know that the spike protein is the um, correlate of neutralizing antibodies, and therefore the focus of assays is on that protein. Uh, functional assays also include uh, neutralization assays, and these take two forms. Uh, you can either use a pseudotype virus approach using HIV or VSV vectored backbones, which allows you to do the testing in a in a non high containment laboratory and, and is more accessible to many laboratories as a consequence. There's also the live virus neutralization assay, which obviously requires um, high containment levels um, laboratory to containment level three. And there are several flavors of that assay, which include things like plaque assay, micro neutralization assay based around cytopathic effect of the virus on the target cell that it infects. And I'll go into these assays in a little bit more detail. Also, there are surrogate uh, neutralization assays that are effectively a binding assay in which the uh, ACE2 binding to the spike protein is inhibited by the test sample. And um, that's considered a surrogate of neutralization because of that interaction and blocking the binding, which is effectively what neutralization is doing. Then also um, assays for evaluating the T cell responses have been developed for using the Ellispot approach. Uh, with uh, which is done by PBM stimulation or using peptide pores of the spike protein and looking for cytokine readouts such as interferon gamma for a Th1 profile and uh, IL-2 and IL-5 to uh, and IL-5 mainly for um, a Th2 response. Next slide, please. So the binding assay 
uh, format is very common and uh, widely used, been in, in use a long time, and, and effectively it is coating your antigen to a solid surface, coming in with a test antibody and then detecting that antibody with a secondary antibody conjugate, and then you get a coloured reaction readout, and you titrate the sample down a 96 well plate or 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 multi well plate, and get a titration curve and you can get a quantitation of that response by the endpoint titer or midpoint titer. And they've been applied to these multiplex high throughput assays such as Luminex and Mesoscale, as I've discussed. Next slide, please. The neutralization assays are, uh, are more complicated and um, require um, the use and uh, access to the laboratories in which um, for the live virus neutralization, as I've said, requires a BSL-3 containment for handling the um, SARS-CoV-2. Essentially, the uh, test antibody is serially diluted um, with the virus in a test in a plate. Uh, effectively, the antibody and the virus are mixed together and if um, and then added to a target cell, usually viral E6 cells or, or a human uh, cell with an ACE2 re receptor on it. And if you've got uh, neutralization, then the, uh, clearly the virus can't infect those uh, target cells. And uh, the um, the readout on that assay is, is done in a number of ways by staining for foci or uh, looking for release of virus. So um, you get the inverse uh, re readout in that uh, the more uh, color reaction or positive staining for virus you get, then that is less neutralization. And there are various methods as I've shown there for counting uh, those uh, cytopathic effect spots if you're doing foci methods and again it's you generate a titration curve and you can quantify the amount of antibody uh, present and you get a neutralizing antibody titer. Uh, so um, yes uh, next slide please. Um, so this is the Ellis spot assay and again it's a, a multi-world plate system in which uh, plates are coated with a capture antibody for either interferon gamma or IL-5 uh, and uh, then you um, then add cells and the um, stimulant which is a peptide of the SARS-CoV protein which causes the cells to proliferate to that specific antigen and you can and then that releases IL-5 or IL-2 into the medium and is captured by the antibody you wash the, the plates uh, of the cells and then uh, you can then detect the IL-5 and interferon gamma on those plates by using the secondary antibody with a conjugate and then uh, usually uh, you add red and blue developer solutions so you can get a red spot for interferon gamma and a blue spot for IL-5. Uh, next slide please. So this shows uh, examples of Ellis spot plates with red and blue spots. I hope you can see the red spots are very clear, the blue ones less so. But you, you can see that you get spots of foci of where the cells have released the uh, cytokines into the um, onto the plate. And you can count those spots very clearly. And again, um, uh, you can you, you use a machine to count these spots and the amount of number of spots is obviously a quantitation of the amount of cytokine released by and, and a measure of the strength of the vaccine response in the individual. And next slide please. So as I said the, these uh, immune response assessments must be done under um, a validated assay and done under quality systems if if these assays need, need to be used for a licensure and emergency use authorization that can be used uh, for clinical trials and then for vaccine uh, testing thereafter. Uh, the validation and qualification studies uh, uh, are involved and use, um, must use well characterized controls and reagents um, that are well defined and uh, clear positive and negative samples that are clinically relevant and and uh, and those quality control reagents would include things like um, positive um, antibody samples or positive uh, virus samples etc and um, a clear replacement program for those reagents must be in on uh, in place to allow for the continuity of those reagents and 
robustness of the uh, assays. And the, and the validation must uh, address, uh, as I've said, precision, linearity, sensitivity. Uh, the sensitivity will have an upper and lower um, um, upper and lower limit of detection and also specificity is is required so next slide please so linearity really is there to show that the proportionality of the concentration of the assay readout is uh, is, is shown so it titrates the analyte and and the proportion of the titration is is uh, is uh, aligned to the concentration of the analyte uh, precision is just uh, about how close the agreement between independent results is, in other words, the reproducibility of the assay, and the sensitivity the ability of the assay to detect true positives um, and to a low level, and the specificity is ability to correctly identify those who have an immune response, i.e. a true positive rate, and the test specificity is ability of the test to correctly identify those that are naive, i.e. also a true negative rate. And to, to, to look at that, you, you really need to be able to look at true negatives, and that um, would in, uh, involve testing pre-pandemic sera. And uh, as we move further into the pandemic, there are going to be less and less negative um, samples that are true negatives. And this could be a problem going forward, uh, and therefore the use of pre-pandemic sera, I think, is going to be a critical uh, component of the uh, validation of assays. Uh, next slide, please. So this just shows you the linearity and sensitivity when you do a titration curve, uh, the blue line there. And uh, in the shaded blue line, there's the linear range of the um, sigmoid curve. And uh, that part is the linearity. So you need to show that the assay has this linear range. And the red and la the red uh, and um, the red and the uh, the two red lines are the upper and lower limits of quantitation, and that's really sets your the lower limit sets your um, sensitivity of the assay. The next slide, and this just talks about uh, shows a, a graphical representation of what we mean by accuracy and precision. So the assay needs to be precise in, in that you get good grouping and reproducibility of the samples from from day to day. When, as you run the assay, the accuracy is, is less important, um, but uh, precision is, is what is needed. So that's what's assessed. The next slide, please. So let's talk about um, standardization. And there are a number of ways uh, to, to look at standardization. Um, um, you can use a standard operation procedure that everyone would follow. Um, and um, so you'd be using the same assay, same reagents. However, as you, as I've said in the original slide, there are over 200 assays now and a multitude of different ways of assessing immune response. So how do you compare those, um, compare that and truly standardize assays? It's going to be very difficult. And there's also the need to monitor the assays with um, performance with quality control reagents. And at NIBS, we produce the WHO International Standard, and we have produced standards for the um, antibody assays, serology assays, as well as um, PCR assays. And these uh, are developed to um, that enable you to develop an internal standard for continuous in-run calibration. So the inter international standards are there to calibrate your assay on a, on a sort of an annual basis uh, to an internal standard. And uh, and then you should report in international units relative to that uh, international standard, and and that recalibration should be done, as I said, on a re relatively regular basis. But the international standard is not there as an in-run control; it's there as a as a in intermittent, not regular calibration tool. And next slide, please. So the problem with uh, using, uh, as I said, uh, comparing assays is that as you as uh, various assays are developed, you get different readouts. So when when you try to compare the data, then you don't know um, which readout and uh, compares to another one. So you could have readouts in in internal units, or a titration endpoint titration, or even in um, SI units. 
But really the question we're all trying to ask here in terms of developing assays is, uh, for our serology assays, is what's, what is the protective titer? And, um, and if you've got all these different readouts, then this is going to be very difficult to understand what a protective titer is. And, and that's going to be important moving forward when, uh, with, when we look at the variance of concern and, uh, and booster jabs given and, and understanding when are those boosters required in order to boost the immune response above a protective antibody level. And uh, so at the moment, we don't know what a protective antibody level is, um, but the international standard and reporting in units will help harmonize all of that data so that we all understand what it means. Next slide, please. So calibration is, uh, is shown here is that you can do it either on a linear range or you, you can do it on a parallel sigmoidal curve. But what you're looking to show is that uh, the two curves of a test sample and your reference sample are parallel. And that difference in uh, the parallelism, can you go back? Yes, thank you. Uh, the difference in the parallelism is, uh, is the reporting of a relative potency. So it's relative to the reference material. Um, uh, as a ratio, effectively, of uh, or a fold difference, uh, and that fold difference is reported in international units. And there are various programs that you can, software programs that you can utilise to uh, assess the true parallelism of your of your sample. And it has to really be parallel, uh, and uh, to to provide and give you um, surety over the international unit that you would assign to your test material or internal standard. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes. So this is um, uh, just to show you how important it is to monitor your sample using an external run control rather than an internal standard. Because an internal standard can drift with the assay. So this is some data that was generated where you can see up to about Point, uh, 29 months, 29 weeks, where there was regularly, the assay was regularly monitored. You can see there's quite a wide variation and up and down uh, curve of the graph, uh, where the assay is poorly controlled and there's a lot of wide variation in the in the reproducibility of the assay. So next slide, please. So this, so we saw a four log difference there, which is not a very reproducible assay. Next slide. But uh, if you introduce an external run control after at the point there, uh, as shown by the vertical line, then afterwards you can see you get good assay improvement by um, by using such a, a monitor and uh, external run control. And that external run control would be um, would be calibrated to the international standard, hopefully. Okay, and, and this is just some examples of uh, data we generate from uh, the study that we um, conducted to establish the first international standard for SARS-CoV-2 antibody. And on the left are ELISA binding assay data as reported um, in raw results to a number of samples along the bottom of the axis, uh, along the, the, uh, y -ax the X axis there. Um, and, and you can see that the data reporting is quite wide and varied. Um, and uh, each and then, but on the right, if you report the data relative to the international standard, which is, is sample GIS along the bottom there, you'll see that uh, we get a narrowing of that um, variation and variability in the reporting data. And, and therefore, you get better uh, harmonization of the data sets across all those different samples. So this is the principle of using uh, an international standard or an, an external standard and reporting relative to it, because that uh, external standard um, harmonizes the assays across a wide variety of samples and, uh, and across different assays. Next slide, please. Uh, one uh, system that I'd like to point out is the uh, CEPI Centralized Laboratory Network. Network. Uh, CEPI is the um, uh, Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which is a, a global company with um, large funding that is supporting vaccine development for SARS-CoV-2 and emerging viruses. And they have set up a centralized lab network, which is a way of trying to harmonize uh, a single assays, uh, 
a number of assays across a, a number of uh, laboratories who use the same SOPs, the same critical reagents, the same standards. And so that if you send your material in, uh, uh, sorry, this material, this network is set up for vaccine developers to send their clinical trial samples in for testing, which CEPI fund. And uh, these network of labs can run that assay and you can be sure that whatever lab tested their, your uh, samples in, they would get the same result if they were tested across other labs in that network. So as well as having harmonized um, assays through a common SOP, they are also harmonized through the use of an international standard. Next slide, please. So uh, I'm just briefly talking about assessment of the vaccine project, which is a product, which is a CMC component there of, um, of uh, vaccine production, which is more of the manufacturing side and uh, the need for testing those samples independently by a lot or batch release testing, which is uh, something that NIBS undertakes. And mainly uh, the testing done independently looks at identity and potency. So identity looks to confirm the vaccine components. Uh, and uh, for example, for HPV, this is done with monoclonal antibodies that uh, detect the right HPV strains in the vaccine components. I think this is important going forwards when we're looking at variants of concern uh, and the different vaccines that may be developed for uh, that are specific for a variant of concern where we might need to confirm that the right antigen is in the um, is in the vaccine. So monoclonal antibodies might be one approach to do that. We can also do immunoblotting to show that um, when you run a Western blot, uh, a monoclonal antibody lights up a single band that's appropriate of the for the antigen in the vaccine component. For potency, this is really to measure the amount of antigen in a product, and most assays now are done by in vitro methods, although there are some in vivo studies still that are, are being conducted, not for SARS-CoV-2, I would add, but for some of the older vaccines, such as rabies and tetanus, but even these are being moved to in vitro methods now in recognition of um, animal welfare issues. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, sorry, that's, that's a repeat of what I've just said. So next slide, please. Um, the RNA vaccines are now a, a new vaccines that have uh, introduced new ways of um, measuring identity. And so these have been adopted. So uh, a number of assays can be used to do that. So identity of the RNA vaccines can be done by um, PCR or the vaccine spike and the vector. They show that that, that RNA sequence is there and, and also the vector carrying it. Um, the potency of the material is the amount of um, RNA in the, in the vaccine. So you can infect target cells with the uh, vaccine product and show you get um, expression of the, or production of the uh, spike protein, or you can fluorescently label the RNA content of the vaccine and quantify it by the amount of fluorescence, or run the, uh, run the RNA on a gel to look at its integrity to show that it's uh, a single band as expected. So these, these assays are still relatively in, in development, but um, these are being used currently for a lot release of RNA vaccines, and it's a new area for lot release, which is uh, under development. And finally, I just um, summarise to say that this so to re-emphasise that so the, all these assays I'm talking about, they must be validated, so they're fit for purpose, uh, which is done uh, and involved an extensive set of assays, which I've talked about, um, and they must be performed under a quality system. This is a generally good clinical laboratory practice under a uh, some QA scheme and use uh, and part of that QA scheme would in, involve that the uh, quality control agents must be used and they should be well controlled. So I'll, next slide, I'll end, I'll end it there and thank you for your attention and thank you. Uh, it was a nice presentation on laboratory assessment. Um, Currently, we have a little bit of an issue to connect with Dr. Mark Page. It's very early in London now. So we are trying to resolve it. Uh, meanwhile, I just have a request for people who are asking questions. Please mention the, the name of the presenter or the 
the number of the lecture so that it's be easy for us to pick the questions uh, in future we'll wait for a minute if they can connect it if you're not able to connect we will go for the next lecture and then catch up with dr mark at the end of this presentation I think uh, we'll go back to Dr. Mark Page at the end of today's lecture after uh, the next lecture. So we'll go to Dr. Neil Berry, uh, his presentation on uh, vaccine development in non-human primate model. Thank you. My name is Dr. Neil Berry. I am a principal scientist and virologist based at the National Institute for Biological Standards and Control, or NIBSC as it's known in the UK. We're part of the MHRA, which is the UK regulatory body. And the title of my talk is uh, Non-Human Primates in Vaccine Development uh, with a focus on SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Okay, next slide, please vaccine development in the non-human primate model. So non-human primates have been used as models in vaccine development for many years, many decades, uh, particularly in the preclinical evaluation of vaccines. Um, this has primarily been uh, with macaque species, but other monkey species have been used and uh, they've been uh, applied to test a wide variety of vaccines against uh, a number of human diseases. And there are three key aspects that we need to focus on. Uh, first is immunogenicity uh, of vaccines at an early stage. So the characterization of immune responses generated by a particular vaccine. Efficacy, do these vaccines uh, protect against wild virus challenge and to what level? And of course, safety, uh, identification of potential adverse events that might occur as a result of vaccination. So multiple vaccines have been developed and aimed at preventing SARS-CoV-2 disease. And this is primarily to prevent SARS-CoV-2 disease, uh, but they may also have an impact on infection. Multiple vaccines, uh, at least 13, have either progressing or have progressed through to phase one to a clinical trials, and then through to phase two, B3 for efficacy evaluation. And these have all been through at a non-human primate model. I think it's worth bearing in mind whenever non-human primates are used in research and testing, the highest standards of animal use and care are essential, not only for animal welfare and ethical reasons, but also to optimise data quality, model validity and research integrity. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to briefly review the range of animal models available uh, to study SARS-CoV-2. We know uh, this virus has a diverse species susceptibility. Um, it can infect many mammal species, and this impacts both on model selection on the left-hand side, but also um, environmental factors and the different variants there are uh, in nature. So the focus of this presentation is on the NHPs, and this is primarily with four NHP species, the Cynomologus macaque, which can be subdivided into Mauritian and Indonesian subspecies, the Indian rhesus macaque, African green monkeys, and the baboon. And for the most part in all of these species, this presents as a mild or asymptomatic infection, but there is 100% homology between uh, human ACE2 and, uh, and monkey ACE2 um, in these old world NHPs. That is not the case with uh, some of the new world primates, for example, corn marmosets and red belly tamarins, where the utility is perhaps uh, less valuable, uh, but we also need to bear in mind that small animal models have been developed, particularly mouse models, uh, human ACE2 transgenic mice, and adeno, uh, recombinant adeno transduced mice. The Syrian golden hamster has um, really come to the fore, fore though as a comparative model, and I'll show some data and some ways we can uh, compare the outcome of Syrian hamsters with, uh, with the data from NHPs. Next slide, please. So we know that uh, non-human primates, particularly the old world monkeys, have very close resemblance to human physiology, and this enables a meaningful comparison of outcomes 
between humans and, and these species. And in fact, the inferences can be made across species. Cynomologous and rhesus macaques have very similar outcomes with comparable pathogenic potential, and these have uh, been of great utility in vaccine development. African green monkeys and baboons have also uh, been identified as viable models for SARS-CoV-2, both in terms of virus replication and disease outcome in both species. As I've already mentioned, these have 100% uh, ACE2 homology across the spike protein and the receptor binding domain interface. And just to reiterate that New World NHPs, although they have been evaluated, have a low homology for ACE2, are overall less susceptible, with evidence of upper respiratory tract, some lower respiratory tract infection, perhaps there is yes, less useful models for vaccine development, but may still be uh, useful to inform pathogenesis and broader species susceptibility. Next slide, please. So when we're considering um, the outcomes of uh, uh, challenge studies uh, or indeed immunogenicity studies, uh, we need to understand, uh, have some knowledge of how SARS-CoV-2 uh, infects the body and leads to a process of pathology and whether we're dealing with direct or indirect effects. And this overall will help us to establish a regulatory scientific framework to inform the interpretation of outcome of animal studies. Because we know that the host would have an impact on the outcome, the species would also age and perhaps other comorbidities. The study design, we're focusing on vaccines today, but this could be a pathogenesis uh, study, it could be a treatment study, but also the virus challenge, whether we're looking at the dose or route or mode of uh, administration of the virus, and of course the sequence, the fact that these should be fully wild-type viral sequences that we're using in these model challenge systems. Next slide, please. So SARS-CoV-2 in NHPs displays very similar dynamics to humans. This has actually been very well worked out now, and I have a slide here on the left-hand side showing the nasal swab kinetics. We know that viral genomic RNA uh, is an important diagnostic marker for uh, COVID-19 diagnosis, and that the RNA is detectable in samples of bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, sputum, nasal and oropharyngeal swabs, uh, but also faeces and in some cases blood and serum of experimentally infected NHPs. And that these RNA levels reach very high levels uh, in swap samples in particular at a very early stage of infection over the first two weeks. So on the right here we have just a pictorial representation of what we might want to achieve with a vaccine in the knowledge that vaccines may, to may need to elicit uh, different responses at uh, different sites to uh, confer protection. And fundamentally, we're looking really to prevent uh, virus infection of the lung with a vaccine to prevent COVID-19 disease. I think in the knowledge now that it's going to be much harder to prevent infection of the upper respiratory tract, but not impossible. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a summary, really, of the characteristic, characteristics of SARS-CoV-2 outcome in NHPs. So the four uh, old world uh, species on the left, um, rhesus macaques, cynos, African greens and baboons, all have high levels of acute infection when we uh, measure this through classical viral shedding uh, measures. This is typically accompanied by um, alveolar inflammation and damage, uh, possibly interstitial pneumonia, which can be uh, more severe in some of the species. And as I mentioned, the mild asymptomatic infection, though, uh, we can interpret the outcome by this lung pathology. And, and that's been a, a, a key observation uh, in many of these studies. And we know that the immune responses are present, so we can detect virus-specific antibodies, both to, both to RBDNS, but also a cellular immune response. And that does actually, actually compare to the New World uh, monkeys, for example, the tamarins and the marmosets, where we're often dealing with low or transient levels of RNA, uh, uh, very little histopathology, although not completely absent. And uh, the interesting thing is that there appears to be no virus-specific antibody response in this species. And that outcome potentially can be impacted upon by the virus strain of the dose. Next slide, please. So if we look at the different vaccine types or classes that have been uh, analysed in preclinical studies of non-human primates, um, 
of the 13 uh, that I've highlighted here. These range from inactivated uh, vaccines, protein subunit, the non-replicating vectors, and the novel uh, recent uh, advance in uh, messenger or mRNA-based vaccines. The rhesus macaque has been uh, widely applied here, but also the cynomonicus macaque and the baboon. And these have gone through to phase three clinical trials and uh, efficacy data has been generated. Next slide, please. So if we deal with the safety, some of the safety aspects first, as clearly we, uh, we advanced, but obviously to, to use a vaccine that was unsafe to use in humans. And there are a number of evaluations that can be performed. Um, I just highlighted four NHP species where uh, uh, adverse events have been specifically uh, targeted. Uh, or, or analysed, and there appeared to be no adverse risk factor with no significant, uh, particularly T helper 2 related pathology in any of the uh, non human primate studies performed. A few changes that would signal uh, other adverse events when we look at, for example, biochemical, hematological, or clinical science. And ideally, a vaccine response should be skewed towards uh, the TH1 response, T helper 1 response. Uh, as I mentioned, TH2 is undesirable, uh, particularly as this can lead to recruitment in immune cells that can contribute to immune pathology. So this analysis of lung pathology does provide a key indication and marker both of the efficacy of a potential vaccine, but also any uh, adverse effects that uh, could uh, be linked to it. And here we're talking about uh, in the unvaccinated panels, Type 2 pneumocyte hyperplasia in the control macaques. Uh, these are rhesus macaques. And underneath, uh, unvaccinated, the brown, um, uh, the brown representation there is SARS-CoV-2 antigen, which is present in both type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes. And that compares with both prime uh, and prime boost um, uh, sections, which are, are completely clear, both of pathology and of uh, SARS-CoV-2 antigen. Next slide, please. So if you look a bit more detail at some of the immune responses that can be characterized in non-human primates, we're comparing here at one of the mRNA vaccines on the left and the non-replicating vector-based vaccine on the right. Uh, both binding and neutralizing antibodies um, have been characterized uh, in some detail. Uh, there is a dose effect that can be monitored in these species, and on the left in the mRNA vaccine, uh, the blue uh, line is uh, the low dose, the red line is a higher dose, the tenfold higher dose uh, would appear to uh, induce uh, much higher levels of both binding IgG and neutralizing antibody. And that compares uh, in the bottom panel with uh, a range of convalescent plasma outcomes or convalescent sera where the vaccinated macaques have at least a high uh, and, and much tighter response to the vaccine in terms of the anti-S and anti-RBD uh, antibodies that can be measured uh, compared to, uh, if you like, a natural infection. And that's seen uh, both with uh, mRNA vaccines, some of the other vaccines as well, so that's just shown uh, on the right-hand side where um, a prime uh, of the immune response is then boosted to give uh, significantly higher results. And, and that's an outcome in rhesus macaques that, that's giving us a very good understanding of what's happening in the pre-challenge phase. Next slide, please. So uh, a detailed analysis of immune responses um, uh, clearly can be performed um, with these models, with these species, and a wide spectrum of immune responses um, uh, analyses can be undertaken. So I've just highlighted here in the top left in the red box, uh, S-specific IgG and uh, receptor binding domain specific IgG uh, measured uh, against the international standard for SARS-CoV-2 antibodies. And this is perhaps one way that we can start to um, form a link between outcomes of non-human primate studies and the human clinical studies. And clearly there is a dose response relationship uh, between the dose of the vaccine and the S-specific and RBD uh, antibody levels when measured uh, or expressed in international units. 
But that also goes for um, other features. So we have ACE2 binding inhibition, antiviral, pseudoviral uh, assays, and so on. And also, uh, when we compare um, IgG levels in the lung, in the bronchial of, of the Lavage, in uh, panels G and I, uh, compared to uh, nasal wash IgG in H and J. Uh, and this article has uh, recently been published uh, in Science by Corbett and colleagues and um, elucidates many of the features um, of vaccination and how the NHP model uh, can be applied. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so not forgetting the cellular immune response in non-human primates, um, vaccination clearly has capability of inducing uh, a Th1 and also a T follicular helper skewed uh, CD8 T4 uh, T cell responses. Um, so on the left that's shown, but also uh, a complete absence of Th2 responses. So uh, we are dealing here again with safety uh, and efficacy considerations. And other features such as, for example, measuring interleukin-2 and other, and other uh, uh, facets of the immune system uh, can lead us uh, uh, to show that uh, vaccination can be associated with robust long-term antibody responses. Next slide, please. So the overall outcome of challenge, uh, just to show here, uh, that, that we can analyze both the uh, upper and lower airways uh, for virus and again a dose response terms in term uh, when we're looking at the readout of uh, viral titers um, either by genomic RNA, typically subgenomic RNA or infectious virus and uh, an absence of lung pathology. <clears throat> Next slide please. So what responses are required of a successful vaccine? Um, many questions remain unanswered. For example, the durability of the response and what actually are the most critical responses. But it seems increasingly unlikely that these will be antibody associated in part, if not exclusively. Although we must not ignore or exclude the contributions of T cell immunity. And can we actually tease apart the relative contributions of these responses um, that a successful vaccine might need to elicit? And certainly in neutralizing antibody to uh, the S part, S, uh, to the spike, uh, uh, especially the receptor binding domain is important, though uh, I think it's worth bearing in mind a broad spectrum response is clearly desirable. And what might the threshold of antibody uh, be that is required for protection? Again, protection against serious lung disease. So limited information about exists about mucosal immunity, although more data is coming to light. And perhaps we need to find uh, more about the parameters of immune memory. So all of these topics can be explored in non-human primate models when we think about passive transfer protection studies, both immune subset depletion studies or challenge reinfection studies. Again, picking apart what might require to be a correlative infection, correlative protection. And this really just summarizes a lot of data um, showing that uh, antibodies administered and detected do indicate there is a dose effect. Um, on the left here, um, uh, antibody 250 mg gig uh, down to zero shows that there's a dose response when we look at uh, outcomes on the right hand side measured either in uh, lung or nasal swab um, uh, viral load measures. Next slide, please. And depletion of CD4, T cells, partially abricates protection. The authors here have shown that uh, depletion of CD8 T cells in convalescent macaques partially abrogates uh, the protective efficacy of natural immunity against rechallenge with SARS CoV 2. And the conclusion of these studies is that cellular immunity is important in the context, perhaps, of a waning or subprotective antibody level. And the cellular and humoral immunity uh, can work in concert to deliver a broad-based protection. Next slide, please. These are hugely valuable resource in COVID-19 vaccine development. Um, ethical uh, considerations and the supply of these animals does make other models important though. And uh, particularly the hamster and mouse models and head-to-head -head comparisons between these species have shown good comparative outcomes. Can we introduce standardization of assays and methodologies to aid vaccine development? Well, yes, I think that is, that is a key development and something that needs to be taken forward 
particularly use of the WHO international standard for SARS-CoV-2, when we can potentially unify data from clinical studies in humans and studies in MHPs. Next slide, please. So this really uh, is an example of how this might be achieved, um, both with the WHO international standard for uh, antibody, and perhaps to a lesser extent, the standard for genomic RNA. Uh, and going back to the Corbett uh, and colleagues at the science study, they report that a tenfold increase in S-binding antibody titers uh, leads to a tenfold reduction in titers. So exploring this further would be possible um, in both um, NHPs and hamsters, where for example, isolation of immunoglobulin or plasma from um, uh, NHPs or human vaccine volunteers can be passively transferred into either of these two species, um, perhaps at different times post-vaccination. And then we can assess the protective efficacy against a range of variants of concern by coming in with uh, different challenge virus. And this could be alpha, beta, gamma, delta, or the next variant that comes along. And in this manner, we might be able to establish uh, a scientific regulatory framework where we can evaluate vaccines as they come through. And one utility of the hamster model on the right hand side is that we do have this additional readout between treated and untreated uh, hamsters, where this acute weight loss phenomenon uh, gives us um, a, a, an easily uh, measurable readout. Last slide, please. So just to summarize, um, we know that NHPs have been evaluated as models for SARS-CoV-2 infection and pathogenesis. These are predominantly asymptomatic models with characterized pathology outcomes. Old world NHPs are highly suited for vaccine studies, both rhesus and synobologous mechanics have been widely used. Immune responses do appear to parallel those of humans and can provide an independent means of evaluating vaccine immunogenicity, efficacy and safety. We can tease these apart um, to look for different correlates of protection. And this in the long run should help us inform vaccine design uh, and improved vaccines. Variants of concern too clearly need to be factored in, particularly for the generation uh, evaluation of next generation vaccines. But overall, uh, I think we can, can conclude that the use of NHPs has facilitated and enabled the rapid development of vaccines. And that these are a powerful weapon uh, in our ability to combat the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Neil, for your uh, nice presentation. Uh, we have a few questions already for your talk. Thank you for joining us on live. Um, so just going with the first question. Uh, does immune system, exactly T-cell memory and immunosenescence in young versus old or also in pregnant NHP done during your evaluation? I, I think most of the, the early studies were really on young um, adult um, macaques, um, really, really to get the models established and to get as much data through um, as possible in, in those early studies. Um, so, so that was... Um, I think that was really the main thrust of, of, uh, of those early studies. So, um, just to probably in relation, how does the saying, my sly, monkeys exaggerate, exaggerate, apply or not to the COVID-19 vaccine research, especially with NHP context? My sly and monkeys exaggerate. <laughs> Is it true with the, some of the studies you have done? <laughs> so, I, I missed the first part of that question. Could you? So, they say that generally my sly, and NHPs, that is monkeys, exaggerate. So how does this apply to COVID-19 vaccine evaluation you have done? Means have you seen anything like this? Okay, so I missed the mouse part. Okay, mice my, have been extremely important models as well. Um, I think, um, at least my understanding of, of the broad range of models is that you have to take each species um, in its own right uh, and perhaps be aware that there are um, limitations and deficiencies of modeling the virus or, um, or thereby interpreting the outcomes within each species. Um, uh, and that goes for mice um, right through to NHPs. Clearly, with the hamster model, that's come through. Um, but analyzing cellular immunity in the hamster model is, is challenging. Um, um, there are fury agents. 
and so on and so forth. So I think I pay tribute actually to the WHO Animal Models Working Group that um, has been the bedrock really of, of many of the studies that have been performed um, in facilitating um, uh, uh, generation of data and um, getting that data out to um, uh, colleagues like myself in the community. So um, I, I think it's uh, you take each model um, in its own right, but be aware that there are there are differences. Uh, that clearly, uh, each model has its own, own merits. Thank you. The next question is: What are the advantages? What are the and disadvantages of conducting NHP challenge studies compared to challenge studies in other animal models, or NHP studies a must for COVID-19? Yeah, I think partly answer that in the last question. I mean, clearly, an NHP, um, you are dealing with um, anatomical organisation that's very close to humans, as, as, as close as it perhaps can be in a, an alternative species. Um, so thereby, you know, you can you can perhaps have more confidence in some of the outcomes, um, particularly the analysis of um, different tissues and um, the, the general dynamics of the infection. Um, but again, um, I think that has to be heavily caveated to the fact that NHPs are not humans, um, but clearly uh, these models can provide a huge, um, a huge resource for, for this sort of study. Thank you. Maybe. Uh... Uh, one or two last questions. Um, can NHPs be used in determining the effects of factors that may affect vaccine-induced immune responses like aging and presence of comorbidities, like diabetes, obesity? And can long-term studies yes. be done using NHPs, or are there any cross-reactive antibodies found in NHPs? Cross-reactive antibodies in NHPs? Are across to humans, is, if that is the question. I, I think, again, you, you take the model um, as a model in its own right. Um, in terms of the comorbidities, um, there have been studies uh, in perhaps more aged animals and ones um, perhaps in different species where it's possible to introduce um, aspects of, of um, uh, diabetes perhaps um, and some of the other uh, more significant comorbidities. I, I think from terms of the vaccine work that's, that's occurred, these have been predominantly young, healthy animals, and, and thereby the immune response uh, perhaps is what we're focusing on originally. Um, uh, you know, is, is perhaps you get the most robust data from, from looking at those, those systems. Thank you. Maybe, maybe one last question. There is a question, but I'm just modifying the question to make it more relevant. Uh, are there any vaccines made so far uh, which has lifelong protection against COVID-19? This was a question, but I just want to put it in a different way. Can you use NHP models to predict the duration of protection in human? I think that's an ongoing question. It's something the field is grappling with. Uh, clearly, we can. the field can perform longer-term studies with NHPs. I, I think it's obviously hard to look at very early correlates that might predict um, much longer term events. Um, I, I think that's pretty much an open question still. Thank you, Tanti, Dr. Mark, uh, for joining us early in the day. And then um, please uh, take your time to answer a few of the questions which we don't have time to cover here, if possible. And have a good day. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So we'll go back to Dr. Mark Page. Probably he's online now, and then for to take some questions. Just wait for Dr. Mark to come on line. Um, I'm having to join from my mobile phone. Oh, here we are. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mark, for now? joining in your busy schedule uh, in spite of all the problems. Uh, so here are a few questions for you which you can answer probably. 
Uh, the first question is, uh, pseudo-typed virus neutralization is a safer and open option to most labs of all assay formats. How is its efficacy compared to other formats? Um, we looked at this in our, in our collaborative study to um, harmonize data using the uh, international standard <coughs> and found that the um, live virus neutralization assay was harmonized equally to a pseudotyrus, pseudovirus type uh, assay. So, we, so they look like they're very well correlated and uh, can be used in labs that can't have a, a, um, can't handle the live virus. So, so I think um, if data is reported against the international standard and international units, then I think they can be viewed as being relatively comparable. Thank you. Uh, the second question is, if T cell responses can be checked by flow cytometry and if comparable to ELISPOT in terms of quality? Say that again. Uh, the T cell responses. Uh, uh, determined by flow cytometry, are they uh, comparable to the results obtained with ELISPOT? Um, difficult question to answer, really. I think you'd need to evaluate that separately. But, um, yeah, I, I don't really have a good answer for you for, for that one, um, okay. I'm afraid. Okay. If, if it's based on proliferation of the, uh, of the T cells, then... Uh, they're measuring different things effectively, but uh, so it's a difficult question to answer. Thank you, I think. Um, the next question is, according to you, what would be the valid cutoff value for ELISA and uh, NAB titer for different COVID-19 mutants? Is there anything which you can give like cut this? Off. Cut off value for cut ELISA, off El yeah, for ELISA and NAB titers. Uh, what do you mean by a cutoff titer? Is that the, the lower, Any lower threshold? level of sensitivity yeah, assets? Yes. Yeah. Uh, not for assay, probably. For probably saying that this vaccine is going to be uh, good enough. Uh, like that. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Well, well um, groups are definitely looking at trying to understand what the protective antibody titers are. And they're likely to be different for different uh, variants of concern, I, I imagine. But... Um, the protective titers that have been conducted by uh, David Goldblatt and also from Miles Davenport in Australia, have, who did a theoretical uh, evaluation of that, were coming to figures of around about 50 to 60 international units per mil, which is encouraging because it sounds relatively low compared to convalescence here. But I think we ought to be cautious about those data and uh, and and we need to be looking at real vaccine breakthroughs to understand um, whether that bears out. But uh, using the international standard and reporting in international units, I think would certainly help us understand what the protective threshold titers are given that uh, we will be running a large number of different assays across the globe and we'll have different reporting uh, ways of reporting that data. So. Um, so using the international standard, I think, will very much help lead us towards determining a protective titer. So slightly related question again, uh, what is your suggestion for validating an assay when an international standard is not available, like that of a present COVID-19? Well, I, I'd like to just re reinforce the point that uh, the international standard is not there to help validate assays. The, the international standard is there to calibrate assays. That is yes. an entirely different um, uh, position. So validation of the assay is really done to look at clinical samples that you have to determine the linearity precision. The international standard is not, not there as a validation tool. Yeah, thank you. Um, the next question is, are there any assays for RNA vaccines that have been validated and standardized globally? I don't think so. I'm not mm -hmm. aware of any. Okay. Main, so, mainly they've been developed by the vaccine de developers so far. So those assays need to be incorporated into pharmacopoeial methods where they would be um, recognized as a standardized method. Yeah, slightly related question is, again, uh, uh, are there any SOPs for COVID vaccine standardized or are in the process of standardization to be included in the pharmacopoeia, especially including testing on different lab animals? 
Um, I haven't seen any yet, but uh, that's not to say that they aren't being done. But they um, I, I don't, I don't think they've been published yet. Okay, I think probably the last question for the day. Uh, do you have any suggestion for a commercial SARS-CoV-2 standard to RBD, Spike, and NC, and uh, with IgA and IgG that can be used in binding assay, since the WHO standard is just for calibration? Um, I th I, there are various, um, well, the, the commercial assay kits that you can, uh, that are, you can buy, uh, such, and even the high throughput um, assays that measure uh, the antibody levels have been calibrated to the international standards. Some of those report an international unit, some of them report as a conversion factor. So those, uh, those kits are available and um, we are conducting a study to calibrate uh, a range of commercial assays so that we can get harmonization and uh, more vaccine commercial kits um, able to report in international units. So that is happening, but there are kits already available that report in against the uh, calibrated to the international standard. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mark, for taking you for uh, joining us live and then answering the questions. Um, have a good day. Thank you. A real pleasure. Happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to all the panelists today for the, the great lectures and the time for Q&A today. And I uh, hope you all in, uh, had some good takeaways from today's lectures, all the participants. Let's meet tomorrow again on clinical development topics. Have a good day.